Uh, okay. <clears throat> no way. No way. What you just watched is a clip of a Pokemon challenge called Taizo Ironmon. Basically, all you need to know is that the game is really randomized, so whatever comes up on the starter table is completely random. So what are the odds that all three legendary birds showed up on the table? Is it one over all the options cubed? Or is it more complex than that? Wait, furthermore, what's the unluckiest moment in Pokemon gameplay history? Is it the Cybertron Will-O-Wisp misses, or maybe a bad critical hit in a speedrun? What about the luckiest moment? In this video, I'm going to show you the most unbelievable clips that you have never seen. And along the way, we're going to learn a little bit about the math behind them, and who knows, you might just walk away with a little bit of knowledge about probability theory. Scary, I know. I have uncovered some of the most unreal clips in not just Pokemon Wonderful. history, but like, all of speedrunning history, too. Buckle up, kids. You're about to hear people say, No way! A lot, and probably a fair few expletives. Here we go! Whether it's encountering a shiny Pokemon or just having something break out of a Pokeball, these games thrive on random chance. Let's start simple. Let's say you're playing Pokemon Emerald and you chose Mudkip as your starter. First of all, good job. Let's say we have a square whose total area is one. Now let's break that square up into a hundred smaller squares. So each of those tiny squares have an area of 0.01 since they're one one hundredth of the total area. Now imagine that each one of those tiny 100 squares represents one of the possible outcomes when we select tackle in battle. Five of those squares represent the possible misses. The other 95 squares then must mean that's when tackle hits. This is called a probability space, where the area of a shape represents the outcomes possible in a situation. So the total area of this square is all possible outcomes. One, the area of our five misses added together is 0.05, which is the same thing as one in 20. You can also represent this in your mind as sort of 1 20th of the square is shaded in. You can think of the square, or really any probability space, as being like a dartboard. If you had an equal chance to hit any point on the square when you throw your dart, neglecting the edges and the boundaries between the squares, then each time you throw a dart is like clicking tackle in battle. About 1 in 20 of your darts are going to hit the red squares, which is the same as clicking tackle and having it miss. But wait, point of 5. 5%? These numbers seem related. Nice work, dear viewer. You've nailed it. I'm about to blow your damn mind. Let's take the word percent. We have per for four, and cent from the Latin word centum, which means 100. So literally, the word percent means basically for every 100. Probabilities, when used like our 0.05 value, are used as a ratio out of one, where one represents all the possible outcomes, like our big square from earlier. But Decimals are like kind of hard for humans to visualize. It's not a very easy number to work with in the marketplace of ideas. We multiply them by 100. This is the same thing as just moving the decimal two places to the right. That's going to be our little cheat code for converting probabilities to percentages. Oftentimes, the most useful way to use probabilities is to find out the odds of two or more subsequent events happening. So instead of just missing tackle once, maybe we miss it twice in a row. The way to calculate your new probability is to multiply the odds of each individual event together. Since we've converted probabilities to percentages by multiplying by 100, we can't use percentages very easily for math on multiple subsequent events. Because if I multiply 5% for the first tackle miss by 5% for the second tackle miss, that gives me 25%, which doesn't really make sense. How can it be more likely to miss twice in a row than to miss once in a row? So, if we want to do math on multiple subsequent events happening, we have to either use the ratio or the probability. Let's use the ratio. 1 in 20 times 1 in 20, or 1 in 20 squared. That square distributes in to both numbers in the fraction, 1 squared is 1, and 20 squared is 400. That means our new odds are 1 in 400. If we make a new big square with 400 tiny squares, we only shade in one of them for the likelihood that we miss both tackles in a row. All the other squares represent other different outcomes. 
We have, for example, the outcomes where we miss the first tackle, but hit the second one. That's a few more. Then we have hitting the first tackle, but missing the second one. That's a few more. And then the vast majority of outcomes where we hit both tackles. Okay, now that you've got a primer for how I'm going to discuss these clips and sort of how the math works behind them, let's watch an unlucky clip and a lucky clip to set the baseline. Oh, boy, howdy are there. Ooh, double miss. Double, double miss. I lose. This game. Corvame is a speedrunner who primarily enjoys speedrunning the 3DS Pokemon titles. She says they are good and or fun. I don't know, I don't really get it either. She's doing an alt main speedrun, which basically just means instead of using the thing in the meta that's the fastest, you use a different Pokemon just to sort of switch it up and add a fun new interesting route. So in this clip, Maze Driplin misses Thunder, and then Walrein misses Blizzard, and then Driplin misses Thunder again, and then Walrein misses Blizzard again, and then Driplin misses Thunder again, and then Walrein hits Blizzard and May loses. Isn't that wonderful? An easy way to find out how likely something is to not happen is to do one minus the odds of it happening. This works the other way too. Okay, so the moves are all 70% to hit, which is the same thing as 70 over 100 which we can simplify because fractions simplify. So if we divide both of those numbers by 10, we get seven in 10. Those are our odds that the moves hit. Now, one minus seven in 10, three in 10. Those are the odds that any one of these moves can miss. And we have five in a row. So remember from the previous section of this video that all we gotta do is multiply three in 10 by itself five times. And then at the end, of course, we gotta tack on the fact that the wall rain hit Blizzard at the end, which is 70%. This comes out to be about 17 in 10,000, 0.0017. This clip is weird because it's sort of unlucky, but also sort of lucky. I mean, it ends unlucky, but in the grand scheme of things, it was kind of nebulously both. Wow. Wait, I don't understand. The runner Mockwing just had a Caterpie break out of a Pokeball. How unlikely is that? I have Pokemon break out of Pokeballs all the time. Well, dear viewer, while you go on living your little lives, going about your day, doing your chores, just sort of typing away on those little keyboards and clicking away on your big old mice, horrible problems for Pokemon speedrunners are solved every day by a terrifying website that looks like it was designed in the 90s. Introducing the Pokemon Catch Rate Calculator. So Mockwing is doing a Pokemon Fire Red Elite Four Round Two speedrun. Basically, they have to capture a bunch of Pokemon in the run to be able to refight the Elite Four at the end of the speedrun. Early game catches are great for this run since they're so likely. In fact, it's usually considered that really early game Pokemon like Pidgey or Caterpie have essentially a 100% catch rate, especially at lower HP values. So what does the almighty catch rate calculator say about this particular breakout? Well, the Caterpie is level three. We're throwing a Pokeball and we can estimate its health to be about 25%. The actual HP value might be lower than this, but this is close enough. 99.994% to catch per ball. 0.006% chance for it to break out. That's about one in 17,000 just on catching a Caterpie. You know, when I set out to research this video, I went into a bunch of communities and I specifically asked them, did anybody have any super unlucky or lucky clips? And something really, really interesting happened. Almost nobody sent me clips of good things happening to them. This is something psychologists and some probability theorists call negativity bias. Here's my friend Average Trey to explain. People are just hella lucky. If they're not me. <laughs> we have a pretty powerful tendency to more distinctly remember negative events than positive ones. I think this is why it's easier to doom scroll on Twitter for four hours and feel terrible than it is to just text your friend and tell them that you love them. It's also why 24 hour news cycles and journalists are constantly harping on you with stories about like, there's been a murder in your neighborhood. And they're not doing stories like, local man is happy the first one garners a lot more clicks gets a lot more butts in seats and pays a lot more in advertising dollars i just think it's important to recognize that we oftentimes highlight the really crazy unlucky things that happen to us rather than the myriad of crazy lucky things that happen to us every day 
I think if we all just serve to change our perspectives just a little bit, we could all be like a tiny bit happier and maybe also stop the terrible 24-hour news cycle from ruining our parents' generation. Anyway, here's some more bad stuff. Okay, thank you. I think a kid there. I... What? 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 I have Pokeras! What? Pokeras. You may have heard of it. It's a pretty unlikely event in Pokemon. Basically, it's about 1 in 21,845. At first glance, this seems exceptionally lucky. After all, Pokerus effectively halves the time it takes to train your Pokemon, right? Isn't that good for a speedrun where you're using one Pokemon the whole time and you want to just obliterate everything? Well, yes and no. When a Pokemon is infected with Pokerus, it gains twice as many effort values, or EVs, per Pokemon fainted in battle. EVs are a hidden stat, at least until recent installments in the series, that increase a Pokemon's individual stats based on what Pokemon you have defeated in battle. I won't get too into the specifics here, there are plenty of YouTube videos that try, try, to explain EVs, but all you really need to know is that if fainting a Magikarp gives, say, one speed EV, if you have Pokerus, you get two speed EVs instead. There might be battles where this is advantageous, but for the most part, at the world record level, Pokemon speedruns are routed all the way down to what EVs you get in the run. For example, let's say there's a fight later in the game that requires you to have a certain attack EV in order to have a high enough attack stat so that you can KO a strong Pokemon. If you have Pokerus, you might not have filled up as many attack EVs along the way because you might have doubled up on other EVs like speed or special defense when you didn't want to. So was this lucky or unlucky? Well, does his reaction give any clues? How? How did I get... What? That's crazy! Maybe you need to see somebody else's reaction. Here's another clip of this happening to my friend Echi in a Pokemon Platinum speedrun really recently. Are you serious? I have Pokerus! <laughs> what the... F no, dude! Uh... <laughs> No, 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 I'm so, this runs now, no! Okay, I mean, 1 in 21,000 is pretty unlikely, but plenty of people have seen Pokerus before. You think I'd stop at 1 in 21,000? Come on, there's some really, there's some really, wow, there's some big numbers coming. Remember that scene in The Social Network where Andrew Garfield's character, uh, Eduardo Saverin, is trying to get into a finals club at Harvard and he eventually pretty much almost gets into the Phoenix? No? Okay, it's just, that's just me. What do you think Eduardo's odds even were? Harvard has an undergraduate student body of about 9,000, about half of which are male, and maybe a fourth of which are in the year in which you'd be trying to get into a finals club, and maybe half of those male students are even trying, so that leaves us with about 560 students. Even if the Phoenix only took one student every year, which is ridiculous, that would mean that your odds of getting in are about 1 in 560. Those odds are nothing. We just saw a man with long hair and a beard scream about 1 in 21,000. I know of an even more exclusive club. My club doesn't have 1 in 560 odds. No, no, no. <laughs> My club has odds of 1 in 65,000. Tell me this isn't about me getting into the Phoenix. <laughs> no, Mr. Saverin. This is not about the Phoenix. This is about the back-to-back -back Gen 1 Miss Club. In these games, a move's accuracy is stored in memory as a one-byte integer, so it has possible values of 0 to 255. One byte is made up of eight binary bits. That means base 2 counting. When a move is selected, either by the player or by enemy AI, a random number generator is called to generate a random number. This RNG call is also to a one-byte integer, so it also has a possible range of values 0 to 255. This is all well and good, but the problem is the function that compares these two. A move in Generation 1 misses if the RNG integer is greater than or equal to the accuracy number. Because the code reads greater than or equal to, if the RNG byte ever rolls the maximum of 255, the function compares the two, finds them equal, and returns that the move should miss. To put it plainly, moves that are intended to never miss under normal circumstances always have a 1 in 256 chance to miss. We're talking about two Gen 1 misses in a row. 
which is 1 in 256 times 1 in 256, 1 in 65,536. Now, we're talking. Let's watch some clips of this happening to way too many people. Wow, I got the fourth turn thrash and then I generally missed it. I did it twice! No, 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 no. Are you actually serious right now? <laughs> I got turn one bod. It needs to be long, ideally. I just gen one mi- I just double gen one missed Lear! <laughs> and perhaps my favorite member of the club, a wild Moltres. I mean, I could go for Peck and if it criticaled, it would get there. Wait, 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 wait. Did it just gen one miss a Peck on me? You see that guy in the last clip? That's shenanigans underscore, Shen for short. That is not the last we are going to see from him. We've seen a lot of unlikely stuff, that's great, but I'm getting tired of these tiny little once in a year numbers. No, no, no. Let's move up a few orders of magnitude into the truly unlikely stuff. Let's revisit that clip from the beginning of the video. Now we can really stretch our probability muscles. So for all three legendary birds to be on the starter table, here are the odds. For the first ball, it can be any of the three of them. So that's three in 386, since there are 386 Pokemon in Generation 3, and there's three legendary birds. Then, for the second one, we've removed one of the birds, so that's two in 385. And then for the final one, we just repeat the removal process to get one in 384. For the numerator, obviously once we have one of the legendary birds, we want the other two to show up. So that's why three becomes two and then one. But for the denominator, why does that number keep going down? There's still 386 total Pokemon in the Pokedex, right? Well, the algorithm that the randomizer program uses to generate the three Pokemon that'll be on the lab table prevents there from being repeats. So once we've had one of the legendary birds, the other two can't be that same Pokemon again. So we decrease the denominator by one for each successive Pokemon. Now we just multiply all those probabilities together, which gives us 1.05 times 10 to the negative seventh. That's about one in 10 million. So many of the clips I've already shown you and probably almost all the moments or clips you thought of at the start of this video fail to represent the total number of attempts. What all of those clips of back-to-back -back Gen 1 misses fail to show you is the millions of collective battles that have been played and recorded by speedrunners in Gen 1 over the years in which there were not two back-to-back -back Gen 1 misses. This is not to say that it's not still cool or that you shouldn't recognize the unbelievable odds of something when it happens. You absolutely should. I'm just saying, you know, next time a shiny hunter sees a full odds shiny and goes bazonko in Sano mode, definitely be excited for them, but also take a look at their attempt counter. Does it still feel that unreasonable? News articles, parents of Thanksgiving, and Twitter blue users alike love to sensationalize things. And saying that something is one in a million based on some study they claim to have read certainly helps them do that. I don't mean to say that we shouldn't show off crazy clips when they happen. I just want you to start thinking a little bit more critically about probability and statistics in your day-to-day -day life. So that, you know, when Uncle Billy comes over for family dinner and starts talking to you about the terrible 1 in 100 voter fraud that stole the election, you can stop for a second and think, hang on, wait, does this racist guy actually know what he's talking about? Probably not. Okay, now that I'm done proselytizing you, let's talk about shinies. I didn't mean to like, you know, like make fun of shiny hunters early. I really do like shiny hunting. I think it's really fun and it's pretty much the purest form of luck happening in Pokemon games. There's really nothing simpler than just looking for a dang old shiny Pokemon and then it shows up and sparkles and you go like, oh my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. He's so cool. He's like, how cool is this? Anyway, here's a clip of a guy seeing two full odds shinies at the exact same time so that you can be happy. Are you serious? Wait, what the f Holy sh I've never seen that before. Oh my God. What the f just happened holy shit. two shinies on stream no way in pokemon scarlet and violet which are video games <laughs> one good thing that pokemon scarlet and violet did do is introduce a king.
Now, putting aside that this is the absolute best Pokemon ever to exist, Dundun Sparse has a chance to be two segments or three segments long. Additionally, starting in Gen 8, there are something called Marks. Basically, there's a fun little chance that your Pokemon has cool little stickers. The gamer you're about to see evolves a shiny Dunsparce into a shiny three-segment Dundunsparce, and it has the coveted rare mark. This one has... Wait. Wait, this is like the one in 1000 mark. Are you Martin? <laughs> Wait. <gasps> Based on the shiny hunting method used, the shiny Dunsparce is about 1 in 683. The three-segment Dundunsparce evolution is 1 in 100, and then the rare mark is 1 in 1,000. Multiplying those together gives us a grand total of about 1 in 68 million. Good God. I've danced around the issue long enough and yelled at you enough about the ethics of math and probability, so here it is the unlikeliest clip I have ever seen. The cool thing about this category is Idiot. the RNG will never be this well if you actually do serious attempts. Huh? It never will happen this like this, or it's you just get them all. Yeah. I'm getting wrecked by Encounter 8 too, it's pretty funny. I've been looking for at least 10 seconds without an encounter. No repels active. This might be the crazy- this might actually be the craziest RNG that's ever occurred. To me. Fuck. I don't know if I can catch what okay. is happening? Hello? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. This might be the least statistically likely thing that has ever happened in the Pokemon speedrun with this currently happening. This. Oh my god. This actually might be the least likely thing that's ever happened in the Pokemon speedrun. Nope, I'm on pure encounter tiles. I still haven't gotten an encounter. It's been 200 steps in the Safari Zone. I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. It's 10% per step. Holy! That was insane. Like any good wedding DJ trying to coax people away from the open bar and to the dance floor, let's break it down. There are some tiles in the Generation One Safari Zone that aren't capable of generating encounters because, you know, Gen One. But in this clip, Shen isn't walking on any of those tiles. The odds of any one step in any of the tiles Shen is walking through generating an encounter is 30 in 256. Shen takes, by my count, about 230 steps without generating an encounter. So if our probability of generating an encounter on any one step is 30 in 256, then the probability of not getting an encounter on any one step is 1 minus that number. Then, we just multiply that bad boy by itself 230 times. From that, we get a whopping 3.5 times 10 to the negative 13th. We have just jumped from around 1 in 100 million, which already seemed unbelievable, to 1 in 3 trillion. Please let that sink in. The Powerball, which is the biggest lottery here in the United States, has a grand prize that's around 1 in 230 million odds to win. You are 12,000 times more likely to hit the jackpot in the Powerball than to do what Shen just did. We may have all just watched the most unlikely thing we will ever see in any of our lifetimes. And it happened in the Kanto Safari Zone. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter. But it matters to us. And that's all that matters. Thank you for watching. I really genuinely appreciate it. If you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing and liking this video because I would love to make more stuff like this. See you next time.